Industrial Group for Tamira. Thanks mm -hmm. so much for being with us. Thank you. It's good to be here. I want to talk to you a little bit about what you guys do. You guys are shifting your platform just a little bit, and I'd, I'd like to see if you could shed some light on the new strategy. You bet. It's, a, it's exciting. The world's changing. So the technologies that were very prevalent and kind of the main technologies that drove the water treatment industry over the past 30 or 40 years, I mean, they're still in use, but the world's changing. And the world's going to more uh, mechanical separation, less chemistry, emphasis on chemistry, so that if Camira wants to stay vibrant and wants to remain a healthy company and prosper into the new markets, it's going to have to learn these new technologies. So it's requiring that we evaluate kind of what our core competencies are and also evaluate a couple different aspects of our core competencies. For example, we're a, a company that is based and relied heavily, relies heavily on petroleum-based chemistries, such as uh, uh, polyacrylamides and other organic-type chemistries. And if we want to maintain our position, especially with the volatile raw material situation that there is in, in the world, uh, we're going to have to develop chemistries that are sustainable. So our research is focused in a couple different areas. First of all, our business model is now focused on applications development. So that we're trying to understand what the new applications are in the future and to position our capabilities so that we're able to manage those and to treat those situations. To support that, we're going to have to develop some new chemistry. So we're investing about 120 million euros over the next four years into research, core research, into looking at specific areas like water reuse and sustainable chemistry so that we can meet those needs of the future. So what you've got is Camaro that is a very strong player in the water industry market, but our vision is to be a true global leader in water chemistry. And in order to do that, we've got to get uh, very competent and become the best at some of the new applications. We've also got to look at changing our technology platform to meet those needs through different types of chemistries. Can you shed a little bit of light on what some of these new applications are and what some of the learnings have been through this you know, four-year project? You bet. Four-year project is just now into its, its second year, so we're just getting up and going. But one area that we found that we really didn't have much expertise that is as hot as any has to do with membrane separations. Desalinization falls into that, for example. There's a lot of chemistry that's used in it. In fact, some of our chemistry is already used in it, but we really didn't understand that very well. And not only did we not understand it, but as water reuse comes into play and people are taking their wastewater and converting it back into process water, okay, so it's no longer wastewater, it becomes process water, that water has chemistry problems that are unique. And as more and more companies do that, more and more problems arise related to that water that need some sort of solution so that they can use some of this membrane technology to do that. So we're spending a lot of time in partnering with uh, you know, some strategic partners that we have, such as the Paul Corporation, to try to understand what those applications are and to really zero in on the application and also to bring in new technologies that will support those applications in the future. Are there other applications that, that are worth mentioning? Or? Oh, you bet. Um, and, and an example where Camira is very, very strong right now has to do with our oil and gas group. And we're very active in, a, in an area that, that is somewhat controversial in North America, but it is a big growth area, and it has to do with hydrofracking. Okay, so we're involved with the chemistry aspect of the hydrofracking process, but concurrent with that, there's a lot of water that comes back up. So we're looking at that as well, trying to understand how is it that we can solve some of the problems of this water that's produced through hydrofracking and gas production in the Marcellus Shale and some other areas in North America, and what can we do about it? How can we contribute to, to managing that? Another area in oil and mining has to do up in Alberta with the oil sands. Again, taking material out of the ground, you're trying to separate the oil from it, which you're doing, but you're also creating quite a bit of mess. You've got a lot of wastewater associated with that, that through the right application of chemistry and through applied research, we hope to find solutions that allow them to do that in a much more environmentally satisfying way, if you will, so that the water can be reused and, uh, and uh, the environmental problems that they're experiencing up at the oil sands can be reduced. Water's really becoming, with every day, every coming day, more and more of a, of a world issue oh. um, with, with the use of just usable water, whatever that definition may mean to whoever is in, in, you know, ultimately consuming it at the end of the day. Shed some light on us, on, on the company's perspective on, you know, what, how, how grave is this problem and, you know, what, what areas of the world are more open-minded to trying mm -hmm. new solutions to solve a lot of the problems that we face uh, in many different parts of the world today? Well, it all depends on who you talk to. No matter how you look at it, the water, the world's use of water for food production, for industry, and for agriculture, okay? 
Those three major uses. Uh, the water use is increasing at a rate such that we're quickly getting beyond our available supply. And the problem is most acute in the areas that, that need water the most. If you look at the, at the world, where, for example, in the fam famine is right now in the Horn of Africa, that is a very, very dry area. Some, to a large degree, a lot of the issues associated with that region of the world have to do with the resource availability of water. Okay, so some of the acuteness and some of the pain that we're feeling is going to become more and more acute so that not only do you feel it in the Horn of Africa, but you could very well feel it in Southern California and certainly in Arizona, parts of Mexico, and then parts of Asia. So which leads me to the, to the point that of all the industries in the world, at least that, that I see, and I've, I've had a lot of experience in this industry, that seems to be the most wide open and seems to be the most amenable to looking at things out of the box Asia and trying. Is. Yes. Really looking at things out of the box is going to be Asia Pacific. I mean, they, I don't know that they have the same regulatory hurdles that we have here in North American Europe, but I see a lot of interesting things coming out of Asia related to membrane separation, uh, related to different types of chemistries for, for water treatment that seem to not get much interest in the United States because uh, in North America, the industry is so entrenched in the ex is status quo, and as long as it's working well and there's not a large economic incentive to, to change, there is very reluctant to change, and I just don't see much occurring until someone forces change due to some sort of need not being met, like a priority pollutant not being able to get taken out of the water. Do you think society is pushing these issues in Asia, or do you think it's really the government's recognizing that there could be a real problem uh, quickly down the road and they're trying to be proactive about how, how to tackle that? I, you know, that's a good question. I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but I'm going to speculate that it's one part the government allowing innovation and it's another part the nature of the Chinese entrepreneur who feels less encumbered by, pardon the expression, by rules or, or feels less encumbered than maybe we do in the United States. They, they're just much more aggressive in terms of their being wide open to different business models and different types of technologies to try it out and to see how it works. And whereas in the U.S. Uh, the EPA might say, you can't do that because that's not EPA approved, I don't know that the Chinese government has those same restrictions. So I think it's a combination of a, of a more relaxed regulatory environment coupled with a more entrepreneurial spirit. And you put those two together and you see a lot more movement. So from a business perspective, how do you guys you know, go into a, a market like that that is a little more uh, open-minded to the types of chemistries you guys are, you know, doing R&D for. Yeah. Um, how, how do you attack a market like that and really try to be, you know, the first players out there or the the market leader or the or the established, you know, leader in the space? Yeah, it's a great question. First thing you do is you throw your old game plan out the door. It goes out the window because what worked in the United States and and in Europe don't doesn't work in China. That business plan just has failed us, frankly. So what we're doing is uh, we're hiring locals, we're letting locals run their business, and we're letting locals do it the local way. So it's more of allowing, giving them the empowerment to experiment and to try way beyond what the rest of the world does. I mean, I, I see this firsthand where we try things in China that, that I think we would not try here or in Europe because of our own paradigms, one part but just because it would be very, very difficult. It would be very difficult to, resource the, to get the resources together to do it cost effectively, and, and I just don't know that it would succeed here as much as it would in China because of the experimental kind of mindset that they have. So the, the, the answer is we're kind of throwing the old game plan out and we're trying to do it in a hybrid Chinese way by letting uh, our Chinese nationals who run the business over there run it their way and uh, supporting them with whatever resources we can give them. From a personal perspective, why have you chosen to work in this industry and, and why are you really spending, ultimately spending your time doing what you're doing? Because it's, it's in my blood. It's, uh, I've been doing it for 32 years, uh, ever since I got out of college. It's been the industry I've been in. Every time I think it's over, meaning when I think it's done, that the run is over, something happens to keep it going. And, and now, to me, the future is so unclear and it's so mysterious and it's sometimes kind of scary you can't help but be excited because you know there's opportunity in it and I've been through the ups and downs and now I see it going into really dropping into a fifth gear and I see an acceleration of the business not only in its its uh, financial opportunity 
but almost in its, uh, its uh, social impact and its social relevance. Uh, it, it wasn't very cool to be in the water treating business when I started, but it is now. People hear about it and they start asking questions. It it's actually becomes good cocktail party fodder and people really want to hear what's going on. Everybody has their own opinions, uh, but it's, it's kind of a cool business to be in now. And it's, it's gone that cycle and it's, it's, that's why I stay in it. The company, Chimera, has been in business for 91 years now. It is a good company. It is, it, it, it is well run and it has been very, very successful. Yet one of the things I'm proudest of, of the company, is the fact that it sees where it's at today and it recognizes that we can't maintain the status quo and survive. So there's active change within many levels, all levels within the company, to find those aspects of change that will help us be successful in the future. And it's not content to rest on its laurels. It, it's, it insists on evolving. And there's some people in the company who don't like to see that. They say, oh, we've been successful for 91 years. We don't have to change. We can continue to do this. Yet leadership doesn't see it that way. Leadership knows better. And as such, I see this company as one that, that is successful today and will guarantee its success in the future. So that's why, that's what I think I enjoy the most. And that's the message I want to leave.